believe we would still be in the summer uh, with the Psalms. And what we do in the summer is we join several other churches that are spending time in the Psalms and this preach uh, from one Psalm to the next until the summer is over after Labor Day. Uh, but I actually felt moved to begin talking a little about something that we don't talk about very often, and that is uh, congregational worship. In this case, I mean congregational meeting. Today, we're actually going to be talking about singing and praising God specifically in congregational worship. Um, but it seemed important to talk about what scripture actually teaches about this very concept, especially because uh, there are uh, laws or restrictions and guidances that actually apply uh, to any public gathering, including the church. And so we need to know what do we think about what God actually commands the church to do in terms of gathering. And if you were here from the beginning or if you want to listen on the live stream, a short recap of that, this will probably be the last sermon in this series. And then we'll go uh, at two sermons or so of a reminder of our mission and vision for Boone's Ferry and then right back into Luke. And I'm kind of hungry to get back into Luke. That's when our discipleship communities start back up. That's just kind of a little snapshot of what we're going to be doing. But regarding this uh, uh, sermon series, we started with Hebrews 10.25. And Hebrews 10.25 tells us not to neglect the public meeting or the gathering, as is a habit of some. And uh, so we're not to make it a habit to just not get together, uh, but rather we ought to encourage one another, especially as we see the day drawing near. So, and the point of the sermon was that there ought to be a greater intensity now than ever, since we're definitely closer to Christ's return, but we also know that we're closer to Christ's returns because the signs he told us are increasing in number. And so more than ever, we ought to be urgent about meeting together. We talk, I didn't actually talk at that time about a habit. If you were here, I, just, I told you to remind me about the habit. I totally forgot to talk about it. But you have to consider in your, terms of your own personal conviction what constitutes a habit. And the more I thought about that, I thought, well, if Jesus returned today and asked me straightforward, do you think not meeting in person for six months constitutes a habit? I would have said, yeah, it definitely does. And so we want to meet in person. We've decided as a church to continue meeting in person. We moved from there to 1 Timothy 4.13. We talked about uh, the command to actually publicly read scripture out loud together and to teach and exhort one another, basically for the word of God to be preached and how important that is and what happens as a result of that um, is actually, we talked about, it's, it's one kind of salvation issue. God saves people through the preaching and teaching of his word. And so we ought not to neglect that either. And if you consider that uh, salvation is at stake when it comes to the preaching of God's word, uh, that really heightens your urgency as well for why a worship service is essential. Uh, more essential than, than, than even the kinds of things that sustain your body because this sustains your spirit and your soul, if you believe. And then today, we're going to capture two verses. There are about four verses that are the most clear verses in all of the New Testament scripture about the public gathering. And it was that Hebrews 10, 25, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 13, and then today, Ephesians 5, 19, and Colossians 3, 16. And they are similar. So speaking of the public reading of scripture, I'm going to drop in here right at Ephesians 5, 19, and it's dropping in like mid-sentence. So we'll go back and see what it actually says. It's never good to look at a verse entirely in isolation from what's actually being taught in that, um, in that particular book. And so we'll be doing that. But for right now, I'm just going to drop in, read Ephesians 5, 19, and then we're going to turn forward in our Bibles to Colossians 3, 16, because these verses actually have something to say about what we do when we come together in person. And it's about congregational singing and worship. So let me read this, 5, 19, Ephesians. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Okay, we will come back and look at 18 through 21 and see what it all means in context. But now move forward to Colossians 3, 16. And this is a more complete verse starting at 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So here in God's word there, you can see similarities right away. You can also see differences. Some of the differences in, are in what's called the occasion for the book. Why did Paul write Ephesians? Why did Paul write Colossians? Those are going to have a bearing on why he says that, and we're going to consider that. 
However, before I started writing this sermon, around Saturday morning is when I started actually literally writing out what I'm going to say word for word. Now, if you were holding my manuscript, you'd see I veer off into rabbit trails. I forget whole sections. What I do is I just try to basically, not quite memorize, but internalize that manuscript and then throw it away. You might have seen me on my computer just a moment ago looking at the section, seeing, okay, reminding myself of that. The reason why I do it like that rather than bring my manuscript up is when I brought my manuscript up when I first started preaching, what I tried to do is say what I said on here and it felt stilted. And a preaching coach of mine said, it sounds like you're lecturing. You know, every once you'll get excited about what you're talking about, you'll walk away from your manuscript and then it's like you're just talking to the congregation. So uh, I think one of the strengths in preaching is, is having no barriers between you and the congregation. Um, but it some does, does mean that I sometimes lose my train of thought. I go home, I wrote something really good, I didn't even say it. So if I start getting confused up here, just start praying for me. <laughs> praying that I'd remember what I'm supposed to say. Uh, but today I'm particularly excited and I've put many years of thought into uh, verses like this and how they apply to congregational worship. And so I uh, may not be perfectly organized in my thoughts, but I do think uh, the, the gist of these passages is going to come out in the sermon. But before I started writing the sermon, um, I, uh, I do just about anything I can to procrastinate starting the writing portion of it because it's the hardest work. Actually writing it down and organizing my thoughts and then editing it, that is the hardest work. If I write any more than five pages, it's going to be an hour-long sermon, so it has to be cut back. And y it's really difficult knowing what ought to be in there or not because there's always so much that you learn from passages like this. And so in my procrastination of starting, I, uh, the thought popped into my mind, uh, what the heck is enriched uranium? I have no idea where it came from. I didn't watch any kind of nuclear bomb movie or anything like that. I guess I was watching explosions on YouTube with my boys. And they asked what the biggest explosion was. And I said, it's, you know, it's the, the nuclear kind of explosions, hydrogen bombs and atomic bombs. And then they asked me what those were, and that's what got me started on thinking about what are those. But actually, I was more interested in the energy that can be harnessed from enriched uranium or, or enriched plutonium. But I didn't understand what enriched uranium was. I do know that uranium, uranium is a very dense metal. So I had this thought, was like, how do you make a, a dense metal more enriched? How do you get more uranium in uranium? What do they do? And so I'm reading on uh, Wikipedia, and I didn't understand everything that they, they said. There were some words I understood, <laughs> but you have to connect quite a few there. But basically, in layman's terms, what enriched uranium is, is there are multiple different kinds of uranium in uranium when it's natural, naturally occurring. But naturally occurring uranium is relatively worthless for harnessing, harnessing nuclear energy. There is, uh, I think it's called an isotope, and it's uranium-235. You know, and then there's uranium this and uranium that, two something. But you need a high percentage. For weapons grade, you need like 95% or 90% uranium-235, okay? So what they're doing, from my understanding, is they're removing things that aren't uranium-235 and then somehow adding in more of uranium-235. I don't know how they do that, and I didn't understand it once it was explained to me either. I, I don't have that kind of scientific base knowledge to understand how that works. But it got me thinking, there are a lot of things I understand that basically are the same process. This year, for the first time, we had our boys do a little lemonade stand, and they made a grip of money doing the lemonade stand. They sold it for 50 cents, and everyone gave them a dollar because they thought 50 cents was too low. So they, they got just the right price point. Um, and, they, and my wife was, was making it with them, and they kept having me be the taste tester. And I was like, this is too water. It needs more lemons or more lemon powder or more sugar or something, okay? So there's all kinds of areas where you need to make something more like what it's supposed to be. The lemonade is too watered down. And it's not just with physical objects that we do this in our lives. It's in relationships, too. I'm a young father. I've got five kids, four boys, and, and a daughter. And uh, I was very excited to have the daughter there at the caboose. And um, I'm noticing, and I knew this beforehand, that uh, one of the only ways that children experience love from an adult is you spending concentrated time with them. Um, and the boys have been asking more and more lately to spend concentrated time with me, which means I haven't been spending enough concentrated time with them. So I do, you know, I go out with one kid at a time. Just the other day, Isaiah stayed up with me late. Uh, he wanted to eat sushi. Believe it or not, he likes raw salmon and rice. So we did that together. And um, 
It's weird. They're finicky eaters. They used to not even like pizza, but they like raw fish. It's, it's <laughs> strange. Uh, but anyway, so spending concentrated time with an individual increases the relationship and the bond you have with that person. It enriches that relationship. And that's true for children or anyone. No one ever feels loved by you if you don't have time for them. No matter how much you actually love them, if you don't spend physical time with them, uh, love doesn't grow in the same way and the relationship gets, uh, becomes unenriched in a way. And so, so you can imagine all kinds of different areas where something has to become enriched and there's a process through which to do that. I want you to think of this concept today of enriching uranium, uh, enriching lemonade, enriching relationships in terms of what happens when we come together in congregational worship. Because what Colossians 3.16 actually says is that we are to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Dwell in us richly. And that that happens through teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And so we're going to work through what does that actually mean. Is there a process by which the word of Christ can become enriched in us, more concentrated than before? I don't know if you've ever heard, I, I felt uh, strongly corrected one time by a friend who didn't even know I needed the correction, but I asked him, hey, uh, what do you think about your church? And I could tell he was about to launch into criticism, and then he stopped and he said, you know what, uh, God didn't make me a church critic. In other words, uh, I'm not, my, my goal in life is not to be critical about churches. And so he completely changed his direction from criticizing a couple things that he didn't feel were good in his church. And my guess is I would have agreed with him, at least in the content of the criticism. But the Spirit redirected him and he started talking about all the things that he enjoyed about his church and that were good. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, that's, that is really convicting. I mean, if literally your job is to be a critic of movies, great. But God never gave anybody the job to be a church critic. It's not an office. It's not a gift. And I felt convicted that myself because in my thought life, I think I'd been a church critic. One of the lines that church critic, whether pastors or, um, uh, or anyone who attends a church, will use to criticize other churches will say, I think that's watered down. It's not concentrated enough. It's not enough word there. There's too much worldliness there. And so we look at other churches. We, we easily begin to judge. It's like, well, we want to be more concentrated. And God, the way he works is we're not supposed to compare ourselves by ourselves. But he does want us to be concentrated. And so it's possible to be exactly what we want to be as a church without comparing ourselves to any other churches or any other people. And that's by letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly as individuals and as a body. To let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Now, I talked about the occasion of, of Ephesians and the occasion of Colossians. Uh, from the best scholarship I've read and from studying Ephesians at a book, there's no way to know with any confidence that there was some kind of specific occasion into which Paul was writing this letter to the Ephesians. That doesn't mean he didn't have purposes. It doesn't mean he didn't want to teach them something. But more often than not with New Testament letters, there's something happening in the church, usually negative, and Paul's writing into that negative thing. If you're the Corinthian church, you're doing about everything wrong, and Paul has to correct just about everything, right? You're, you're just being disunified. There are horrific things, immoral things that are happening. So 1 Corinthians, it's easy to figure out the occasion because he mentions over and over again, this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. They were using the, the, the spiritual gifts kind of like weapons, you know, against each other to differentiate each other. Or, I've got tongues and so I'm better than you. That kind of thing. So even these gifts that were meant to build the body up in love, they had twisted somehow. But with Ephesians, we just don't know what was going on well enough and there isn't enough evidence even in the letter to the Ephesians itself that says that. Um, but Colossians, it's different. There was some kind of heresy and false teaching that was circulating around. And so it's not hard with our reason and, and skills of interpretation to figure out, oh, well, maybe the reason why in Colossians he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, admonishing one another on all wisdom, and only then singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, is that it's become all the more important for the congregation sort of to self-heal when it comes to these Trojan horse heresies that are coming in. And uh, we actually don't know for certain what the heresy was in Colossians. You have to reverse engineer it based on what Paul is teaching. So if he felt he had to teach this, then maybe this is what the opposite stuff is. But that maybe is really important. And we make mistakes in scholarship when we decide that maybe is actually a certainly. 
So we don't really know what the heresy in Colossians was either. Here's why it's important. These verses are actually incredibly similar, but written into different occasions. What does it mean for the word of Christ to dwell in you richly? Does it mean the same thing as for, uh, in theory at least, for the word of Shakespeare to dwell in you richly? It does in Shakespearean actors. It dwells in them richly. But do we mean the same thing by that? Think about it this way. If you memorized all of the Bible, does that automatically mean that the word of Christ dwells in you richly? What if you don't do any of it? What if you don't believe it? Or what if you don't believe it because you're not doing it? So you say you believe it, but you don't really believe it enough to actually live it. What if you want to live it, but you don't have the power to do it? So there's lots of ways in which you could really know the Bible well and memorize it and study it, and yet it doesn't dwell in you richly. And we're going to encounter the Pharisees in Luke coming up in the next couple chapters when we start back in September, and you're going to find out the word of Christ does not dwell in them richly, although they know the word very, very well, better than just about anybody else in terms of just like the content. But they get so much of it wrong, they get the heart of it wrong. So what does it mean for the word of Christ to dwell in you richly? It means more than just understanding and doing God's word, because you can understand and do Shakespearean stuff. You can understand and do Borders book, self-help books, but they're not supernaturally powerful in the same way that God's word is supernaturally powerful. So turn back to Ephesians 5.18, and you're going to see a verse that actually turns out is very similar to letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Because it turns out biblically the only way that the word of Christ can dwell in you richly is through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Talked about the letter to the Corinthians. Paul teaches us there you can't even understand the deeper meanings and therefore the only real important meanings of Scripture apart from the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Only spiritual people can understand spiritual words. And spiritual people are people that are in the world, in whom the Holy Spirit has come to reside permanently. So he has a teaching ministry. That's one way. So do you think that it's important for us to have Christ's word dwell in us richly that we would actually have someone teaching us? Yes. And not just human beings, but the Holy Spirit. In fact, 1 John says that we've all been anointed with the Holy Spirit in such a way that we can actually understand what God's word says. So anything that I say today that's true and that's from the Lord is not just human words or not just my words. They're actually words that are taught to you by the Holy Spirit. There's a distinction there. I may say something that later I realize, I don't think that's actually as biblical as I want it to be. But the fact of the matter is, each one of you can figure that out by yourselves through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's the great teacher. And I'm just one of the minor teachers among many other minor teachers. Just like Jesus is the great shepherd and any elder is just a minor shepherd in comparison. But... If there's any real value to my preaching to you, it's because the Holy Spirit empowered what I said and taught it and illuminated it and revealed it and helped you to understand it. And then another ministry of the Holy Spirit is he gives us the power to actually do what God's word says. We find out that even though we've come to believe the flesh is still alive to some degree in us, you know, a fancy theological word is mortification. You've probably heard of glorification, us becoming exactly like Jesus someday. Well, mortification is when the things in us that resist the spirit begin to die, to die away. Mortification, killing off the flesh. And it actually says in Romans that we are to put to death the misdeeds of the body by the spirit. So he helps us to do that. He helps us not only to be enriched with what it's like to become like Jesus uh, and, and, and have that dwell, but he also, when it comes to metals, when you uh, heat them up to a certain degree, then the things that are not actually the most dense part of that metal, the dross, I think it's called, come to the top and you slough that off. So sometimes there are things for us to become more enriched in Christ's likeness that have to fall away. That's the Holy Spirit's ministry too. Sometimes there are things that may be a sin for you, but not for other people. Here in this very verse, it says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, don't worry. I'm not saying that get drunk is okay for some people, not for others. It's actually a universal truth for all Christians that you cannot get drunk, and you cannot be drunk and be filled with the Spirit. Getting drunk is a fleshly act. It's something that we do that... Uh, that actually hurts and harms our relationship to the Spirit. But different people have different relationships to alcohol. 
There will be some people who say, I feel convicted that drinking at all is a sin for me. Whether they had an alcoholic past or not, they feel that kind of conviction. And then there are others who feel that they can drink in moderation. Biblically, that is also allowed. But the Holy Spirit can convict you of things that are not necessarily universal sins. And Romans 14 talks about that as well, where there, there are convictions that, uh, that are applied to you personally. I know this would be wrong for me to do this. I know that that would be based on doubt. And I'd be doing it because I doubt, or I'd be doing it because I don't doubt. And anything that's not of faith or is of doubt is not of faith. And so that's actually sin. And so not everything about sin is, is cut and dry. Uh, there are some subjective areas where you know there's something wrong in your heart and the Holy Spirit's ministry comes in and convicts you of that. He also, because we become blind to our own sin on the universals, you know, maybe a husband says, I think the Lord is leading me to leave my wife, which is never, ever, ever the case. God will never lead you to be the active partner in a divorce. And the Holy Spirit can come in and convict you of the hardness of your heart and lead you to those passages where it says, do not get divorced. I mentioned divorce now. I do want to mention, I do believe there are times where it's biblically allowed to be the passive partner. For example, if, you're, if your husband or wife are not Christians and they want to leave you, the Bible actually says, allow that. You're not bound, allow that. It doesn't mean you have to, it doesn't mean you push for it for yourself, but you might allow them to leave after a time of trying to heal the marriage. Anyway, this sermon is not about divorce. It's about, in this case, about the idea, the ministry of the Holy Spirit being a convicting ministry. So he will convict you personally of sin. And sometimes that's not just as objective as you might think. There's a subjective and we need that in there. But he also convicts the world of what's actually good. Not just what's wrong in you and individuals, but of what's good. Convicting the world of righteousness, Jesus teaches. So there's all of these ministries that the Holy Spirit has that we need that we wouldn't even be able to understand what's good, right, and true, what's really wrong and should be condemned and judged, and how we ought to live in that, especially in those areas that feel a little bit more gray. Should I do this or should I do that? And you don't feel like the Bible is 100% clear on it. And the Holy Spirit can give you guidance on that. And another ministry that the Holy Spirit has that we learn about in Romans 8 is that he actually interprets our prayers to God and helps us to pray in ways when we don't even have words. When it's like groaning and, and the thoughts and are so unformed that they're too deep for words, but they're spiritual. And he actually helps us to lift up those prayers to God in a way that God knows what we're asking for. He has a ministry of empowering our prayer, teaching us how to pray, and to help us pray when we don't even have the words to say what we need. I could go on and on and on. There's probably 10 or 15 more things that the Holy Spirit does in relationship to God's Word dwelling in us. It says in Hebrews, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Shakespeare is not living and active in the same way God's Word is living and active. This is more than just paper and ink and words and ideas. The Word of God has the power to supernaturally transform you. Think of transformation uh, in the sense of a caterpillar becoming a, a butterfly. A caterpillar is not a butterfly, and a butterfly is not a caterpillar. And if we didn't see the metamorphosis and weren't able to study that, we wouldn't classify them as the same insect. And so they change. They literally become something different. And God's Word can cause that in you. How many times have you heard somebody who doesn't believe say, people don't change? And how many times have you been you know, con become convicted or tempted to believe, yeah, people don't really change because Christians oftentimes change really slowly and only incrementally as well. But I'm a living example and many of you as well. If you had known me in college, you wouldn't even like me. You would have never believed that God would call me to become a pastor. I was mean. I was angry. I was an intentional liar. I think I was on the road to becoming a sociopath, to be entirely honest. And <laughs> Saying you have sociopathic tendencies as a pastor does usually get a chuckle, but it's not actually that funny. And, <laughs> and that wasn't supposed to be funny either. But God rescued me from that. And I was transformed. To this day, people that meet me that knew me back then, it's like I'm a different person to them. They don't, where's, where's the mean, sarcastic, spiteful, angry, untrustworthy guy that, you know, that just intentionally try to say mean things to him because it made him happy or something. I'm not that man anymore. 
And one of the things that happened is that I either learned for the first time or remembered what my dad had taught me is that every human being has eternal value because they're made in the image of God. I had become convinced that uh, some of the people that I just really don't like are just not as valuable as me and other people that I do like. So strange, because that's not what I was taught at all. But then when I really either recommitted or came to the faith for the first time, and I, I don't even really 100% know, because I was not walking in my faith at all in college, and, and then all of a sudden it became entirely real. But either way, there was a transformation that happened, a regeneration in which I started thinking of people the way God does, as eternally valuable. And do you want to sarcastically tear people down that have eternal value in God's eyes? Do you want to be mean to them? No. I, so I was beginning to be filled with a love for people. Even a love for people that have a completely different worldview than mine. You might imagine that going to Portland State and being a Campus Crusade kid would produce two very different worldviews. And it was. There, I didn't agree with half the students and what they would say. But then I was filled with this love for them. Like how they don't even know God. And they, how, where's their hope from? They must be so lost and lonely. And instead of being like, wow, you people with your different worldview, I started to have love for them. So I went from hatred and malice towards people towards love. God has changed me drastically and he continues to change me. And, uh, and even then, sometimes my flesh resists and I grow too slowly. But the Holy Spirit actually, through the word of God, has a ministry where he comes in and reaches and just boom, and you're different. You can actually pray, God, change my heart. And if he desires to do so in that moment, he will, and then your heart will be changed. You will have different desires. It wasn't like he just blasted and stomped out a desire here. It's like it dissipated and kind of just trickled away. And then all of a sudden, this other desire becomes really strong. So now, enough about that idea. But the dwelling of the word of Christ in us richly, and that being enriched, is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it wouldn't happen without the Holy Spirit. So when you say, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, it's a similar saying as let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not exactly the same. But we also need to address the fact that things like drunkenness dissipate the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is where we oftentimes get uh, confused as Christians. Uh, it's an area where I want the church to be a lot more clear than it is. Uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit is not the same thing as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you become indwelled with the Holy Spirit one time, once for all. He comes to reside in you permanently forever. He seals you for the day of redemption. Seals. It's not going to become unsealed. And so the Holy Spirit will not leave you relationally in terms of salvation just because you get drunk. But the Bible also talks about us grieving the Spirit or quenching the Spirit. When you grieve the Spirit, I think of that as oftentimes um, maybe you, you can commit an individual isolated sin or even uh, a sin that uh, is part of a past pattern that you used to do all the time but now you're doing it and all of a sudden you start slipping back into that pattern you really grieve the Holy Spirit when you decide to partner with your flesh rather than him in some particular area but then the quenching of the Spirit if you think of a fire and you're throwing a wet blanket on it uh, I think of that as like living for your own agenda you know, God says, have your life be based on things that have eternal value. And instead, um, you're pursuing some kind of suburban dream and materialism. That kind of thing quenches the spirit. Uh, the way my dad, who taught me many of these things, and so many times that I can just speak about them ad lib, uh, is he thinks of electrical circuit. And when <clears throat> it's not that the power isn't flowing to that circuit, if the, the switch is still on, that's kind of like our indwelling. But if you disconnect the circuit, the power isn't complete. And so the, the circuit doesn't have power. And what you do when you sin, uh, when you grieve the Holy Spirit or when you quench the Holy Spirit, is you disconnect that power. Another example I've heard is like a water heater that has a pilot light on. The pilot light on stays on at all times. It doesn't mean the water is being heated. So the Holy Spirit's there. He doesn't leave you relationally. But when you get drunk, you disconnect that power. You disconnect that power. And so what should you do? Well, you should do 1 John 1, 1.9. It says, if uh, <clears throat> we confess our sins, Jesus, our God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The confession of sin, even on a daily basis, reconnects that power. So the filling can happen over and over and over again in your life, and it needs to. It's part of that refinement and enrichment process. It's part of getting rid of the things of your metal that aren't like Jesus, that aren't enriched uranium, that have no value to produce power 
uh, through the Word of God in your life. So you can see how there is a lot of similarity there between these two, and so I'm going to jump back and forth. So now back to Colossians, um, we go to another little segment that's different because the occasion for the letter is different. Um, and it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. You know, it says one another. One another is not the same thing as me coming up here and preaching God's word. Am I teaching and admonishing? Sure. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes I'm exhorting. Sometimes I'm encouraging, challenging, convicting, maybe even rebuking. But the picture here is different than one person teaching the whole congregation. It's, it's about, like I said, like that self-healing. There's a, a teaching ministry we have one to another, teaching and admonishing. So before uh, we figure out the context and the picture that Paul paints of how that would happen in the church, not the only way, but one way that would happen, I think you all understand what teaching means. There are different forms of teaching, but teaching is simple enough to understand. We don't need to spend a bunch of time on it. But admonishing, and the Greek word behind that, it's harder to understand. I don't know what you hear when you hear admonishing. It's not a word that we use all that often. But it's, it's a word we ought to think of warmly. When you hear correcting, is that a warm word to you? It's, that, it's not fun to be corrected, even if the person correcting you is right. It's good. Afterwards, you ought to love them more if you have a humble spirit because they spoke the truth and love to you in a way that they knew was going to be difficult and might cause some dissonance. But correction and rebuke, those are too harsh of terms to really uh, fit the range of meaning of this Greek word that we translate as admonishing. As a word picture, I like to think of uh, sandpaper. Now, uh, if you took... If you just look up enriched uranium or even depleted uranium, they have these little discs and they look like giant quarters, thicker uh, and, and wider. And they usually have holes in them after they've been used. I'm not actually really entirely sure how they use those discs in, uh, in any kind of nuclear reaction. But it's very dull. It's a dull gray metal. But if you took even a low grit sandpaper and started sanding that uranium, it would come to a mirror shine like almost all metals do. I think of admonishing like that kind of thing but spiritual like spiritual sandpaper so it's not just that you just get pure encouragement you feel so good about yourself there's some there's some grit in there a way that you might be being polished okay and you might think well that doesn't sound fun uh, and sometimes maybe the admonishing has a little bit heavier grit but if we continue here it says singing psalms hymns and spiritual songs the context in which Paul is envisioning that the word of Christ would dwell us in us richly and the teaching and admonishing of with all wisdom actually has a song and praise worship component. A song and praise worship component. So now imagine us together singing like we just sang, all agreeing with the content of these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs that we're singing. We'll go into what those words mean, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There's a teaching aspect of it. I've never sung a single hymn and not been taught by it. There's a whole lot of doctrine in modern day hymns. What I mean by modern day hymns is not ones that aren't hundreds of years old. Those are still modern day. I mean, hymns is compared to Hebrew hymns. But there's a teaching ministry and there's an admonishing ministry too. There's, you know, that song prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. That's an admonishing kind of lyric and verse. Like we're saying we're prone to wander. Not everyone agrees that you're prone to wander. People tend to have a higher view of themselves than they ought to, but we're actually broken in a way that even this God that would die for us, he loves us that much, and yet we're still prone to somehow want to walk away from him. That's, that's an admonishing thing. Wow, Lord, over and over and over again, left to my own devices, I find a road that diverges from close relationship to you. So we admonish one another with verses and lyrics like that, and we do that publicly. Now, I want you to consider what begins to happen when the enrichment of uranium is depleted or the word of Christ begins to dwell in you less richly. Okay? In um, James, it talks about somebody that hears God's word but doesn't do it. And by the way, the power to do God's word is in his word as well by the Spirit. So some people will say, well, we, just, we need to just start doing what we know from God's word. Stop always studying it. And that's... It's a total lie. The power for doing God's word is also a function of the word as ministered to you by the Spirit. So you need to continue studying God's word, but you also need to do it. But someone who studies God's word, understands what it means, and then doesn't do it is just like someone who intently studies their face in the mirror and then walks away and immediately forgets what they look like. And that happens to us as we disengage 
from God's word, as we stop spending time in it, we begin to forget what we actually look like. We begin to think that the desires that we have that are actually fleshly are godly. And that that low-grade voice in the back of our mind that's conviction is just maybe some kind of worldly construct on us. I have seen, I'll use young men as an example because I have uh, uh, plenty of experiences in relationship to young men. Young men get involved with uh, um, a girlfriend and all of a sudden they're starting to question God's word, especially in those areas that tells them how they ought to relate to their young girlfriend. And so they start saying that the reason why they're walking away from faith is they just stopped believing. But the real reason they're walking away from faith almost every single time with a young man is because they want to live in a certain way in relationship to some woman. It's a desire that's gone wrong in them. It's gone sideways. And so they start to justify. It's like, well, this is going to be the only woman that I ever date. And so she's going to be my wife. And so I am monogamous. So I'm basically fulfilling the spirit of the law. And they do cartwheels and jumping jacks and all kinds of weird mechanics to get there. And how do I know this so well? Well, I actually did that in my life in college. Did that very thing. I still remember my brother telling me we were... I was laying next to him in, in bed at a, a little rental vacation house. And he goes, look, you're, you're so good with your words and you're arguing me into the ground. But at the end of the day, you know that it's just about basic obedience. Boom. Blunt force. Rebuke in that case. And I knew he was right, but I wasn't ready to live any differently. <clears throat> so in this case, of, uh, I actually completely lost my train of thought. Now's the time for you to start praying. I'm going to have to get back online here. Why did I start talking about young men? <laughs> falling away from the faith and justifying it, letting the word, oh, letting the word of Christ dwell on you richly. As you become unenriched in God's word, you begin to drift from who you are in Christ. Even believers can drift very far away. Someone must have prayed. I immediately got it back. That was very cool. So you see people speaking of this term, not in a church critic way, but in a reality way. When you are not praying with God, when you're not staying close to him, your relationship becomes less concentrated and you begin to start being more susceptible to the teachings of the world. And you start believing things that aren't true. And you see this in Christians that are getting watered down or where the, where the word of Christ is becoming depleted in them because they're not engaging uh, in God's word or in prayer or not coming to church and being admonished and worshiping together. And what begins to happen almost always is their perception of what is evil is becoming diminished and the perception of what is good becomes less urgent. And so they become more gray. Things are, are a lot less black and white. They're a lot less convicted about things. And so now when the world comes in and teaches something that's actually unbelievably evil and completely incompatible with following Jesus, according to the direct teaching of Scripture, they're actually liable to begin agreeing with it. Because the word, it, the uranium is depleted and the power of belief has become so diminished. And it can happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone. Anyone who knows God's word and studies it intently and then begins to just not even apply it, grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit, they begin to forget who they are. They're like a man who looked in the mirror and just doesn't even remember what they looked like. They're like a person um, who is disconnected from the power of the Holy Spirit. So now, considering that, Consider the urgency of the singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts because it's part of the enrichment process of the Word of Christ dwelling in you richly. It's part of the concentration. You think, well, you know, <clears throat> well, I could be a lone wolf Christian. I could study God's Word and I could uh, um, pray a lot and I could have the Word of Christ dwelling in you richly. That's actually 100% false and impossible. And here's why. Because God's Word is the very word that tells you that you need to be with other Christians in a local church. Don't neglect to meet with them. So you're saying, well, I let the word of Christ dwell in me richly all by myself at home. It's like, no, you, you may believe you do, but you're not actually doing it because it says don't do it like that, right? So all it takes is the Holy Spirit to just come in and be like, boom, I'm not really doing what God's word says. I need to be around other Christians. Now that's kind of blunt force obedience, but what about desire? Shouldn't we desire to be around one another? There's something so powerful that happens when we're together like this. When we know the world around us 
hates certain views that we hold very dear and that we know that are true and that they're right and they're good and they are meaningful and life-giving. And we sing about them in our songs and we know what they mean and we know what they mean together and we're affirming them together and we're affirming them in these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So let's actually talk about what we can know about these words. Psalms is probably the easiest one to find because we actually know what the psalms are. And if you've been with us long enough, especially in the summers, you know that we actually literally just sing songs set to some new melody and, and, and rhythm and lyrics. So we'll actually literally sing psalms. But there's also other songs uh, that are inspired so closely by the psalms and almost the exact same words, but maybe not literally that, that verse. And they, they take an artistic license to change uh, the way the, the words are ordered because maybe there's a rhyme that happens in the English and, not, and we're not singing in Hebrew. And so I consider those kinds of psalms, psalms uh, songs that are inspired directly by the songs and psalms themselves to be in that category of singing psalms. And then hymns. Think of hymns a little bit harder to define because almost certainly we're not talking, this word was not talking about modern day hymns, but the Hebrew hymns, you know Jesus sang hymns? He sang a couple hymns right before he went out into the Garden of Gethsemane. It says that in the Gospels. Then those would have been Hebrew hymns. And Hebrew hymns were different in Psalms that they were not necessarily, uh, literally, directly the exact words of Scripture, but they were deeply inspired. They were considered sacred songs. That's actually one of the meanings of the Greek word, sacred songs. And they would be set to a, a rhythm and a meter that was similar to other hymns. You listen to Hebrew hymns and they have a very distinct sound. It's like, oh, that's, that's Hebrew music. And that's a he Hebrew rhythm and meter. And that's a Hebrew language. And so these songs and hymns, I think that uh, modern day hymns fit, fit well enough into this category because we do the same thing. They're sacred songs to us. They're deeply inspired by scripture. They have a teaching ministry in them. Going back to the Psalms, a lot of Psalms are written in a way that you can tell they're delving into the deep emotions of human beings when they're seeing something being done that is very different than the will of God in their lives and they don't understand and, and they want the will in, in heaven, God's will in heaven to be done on earth and they're seeing this dissonance and it's causing emotional friction between them and God and emotional friction between other people. And the Psalms are almost like a guide for us to reconnect the deepest place of our human affect back to the God of truth in worship. It's a ministry of the Psalms. One of the most powerful ways to get right with God emotionally is to immerse yourself in the Psalms and singing them. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but uh, I'll just give you a quick example. If you've seen Castaway um, and that scene where uh, he's uh, the Tom Hanks' character was cast away onto an island. He's got no friends and he makes himself a friend out of a uh, little volleyball and he calls it Wilson. You know, and at first it seems kind of weird, but you know, you might, maybe he's going a little crazy, so you suspend your belief. But then he's on a raft, the raft breaks apart, Wilson's on one, and uh, he's on the other. And he tries to swim out, but he can't get there and he can't carry his raft over, so it just keeps floating away farther and farther. And he begins weeping about losing R Wilson. And if you have a heart, you're moved. But if you turn off Alan Silvestri's composition or the theme song of it, you're not. Watch that exact same thing without the music coming to a crescendo and it's just not as moving. It's not just about Tom Hanks' acting where he can make a relationship to a volleyball come alive. It is the emotional intensity of the crescendos of this beautiful song composed by Alan Silvestri. It was like Braveheart. is like all of them, right? So music, even that's not spiritual, connects to our emotions in a way. So now imagine a song like Alan Silvestri's, but spiritual meaning and mediated by the Holy Spirit to come down and reach into your heart and grab that emotion that wants to go astray and say, God, you're not as good as you said you were, or you're not in control. And both have to be true simultaneously for us to worship God. He's always all the way good and he's always all the way in control. And yet you look at what happens in our world and gosh, your emotions begin to go haywire. How can it be true? How can I continue believing that? And worship is is the thing that can just bring you right back, even in your emotions. And your emotions matter. We tend to downgrade them too much. It does say to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Your emotions need to be coming with that too. He doesn't want just cognitive worship. But when we move forward to hymns, just consider modern day hymns now. Modern day hymns are so rich theologically. They're so powerful for teaching us and they, they engage our worship at a, at a mind level. And we're to love the Lord our God with all our mind too. 
There are some hymns that have concepts in them so deep that I think the majority of Christians don't even understand what these, some of the verses mean. It's in particular, when there's hymns that are inspired by the book of Leviticus, right, where, where it's atonement theology written in, um, uh, written in English and sometimes in an English that is long gone and we don't even have those words. And yet, if you study these hymns, you understand that whoever wrote them yeah, enriched uranium found all over these hymns. And so I, I, there's a reason why there's these categories of songs. But the most broad one and the hardest one to define is spiritual songs. And the word behind spiritual is pneumatikos. And it's really defined as someone who's indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Uh, people say, I'm spiritual. But in, this, in a biblical sense, you are only spiritual if the Holy Spirit is living in you. So Holy Spirit inspired songs, which are almost always inspired through God's word. But there's a range there. And I think this is probably the range that creative uh, worship leaders like the most because it allows them to write brand new songs inspired by the Holy Spirit, tempered by the word, inspired by the word as well. Um, so th this allows for a very large range of the kinds of songs we might use in worship. And we all have our different preferences. I have my preferences, believe it or not. And, uh, and those preferences are not the primary thing that I use to, to, to lead or oversee worship teams. Uh, in fact, if you're a part of us um, for a while, you know that we uh, used to have 9 a.m. sessions. And we together, as a church, decided on a criteria by which to choose songs. They need to be biblical. They need to be Christ forward, Christ centered. Uh, someone actually said they do need to be um, engaging the mind. And someone else said, well, they also need to be engaging the emotions. We had all of these things. And as long as the songs that were chosen fit what I think was a robust criteria for these songs, it's a song we can use in worship and will glorify God. And there are songs that don't fit in that category. That are songs that have errant theology in them. That say things that just don't show the right picture of God or uh, the wrong picture of, uh, of the cross. And so we leave those songs out at times. And uh, especially the more we find out what is actually meant by the words of certain songs. And you don't always know. But we allow for a broad range of songs because it's actually commanded by God. Singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh, and, and new songs. Sing to me a new song, it says in the Old Testament. So the writing of new songs, the writing of new hymns, the writing of, of um, psalm-inspired kinds of songs, all things God wants to be worshipped with. Now take all of that, all those kinds of songs, uh, and, and their spiritual power, their teaching power, and their power to be able to bring our emotions back to a place of worship when they're all haywire and struggling. And now consider all of that in the context of a worship service, happening in a worship service. I have seen some of you in tears. And I know some of you well enough to know, I think they're probably in tears for this, but it's not so much that I'm thinking about why are they crying. It is such a powerful spiritual experience to see someone just weeping in a service, worshiping, and you can just tell God's doing something really powerful in their life. And sometimes they're tears of joy. And sometimes there's no tears at all, but someone's just raising their hands and you can just see them being made alive in the spirit. All things you don't get through lone wolf Christian expressions of faith. And uh, one more thing that's true even of secular worship, but imagine how much more it's true with the Holy Spirit and with spiritual content. I watched this movie where... Um, a uh, platoon or a group of soldiers was uh, marching to their almost certain death. They, uh, it wasn't a suicide mission, but they were the last left, the last line of defense before this village was going to be destroyed. And they had a righteous cause. They were fi fighting a military that was most definitely evil in their tent. And, uh, and they were going up against a lot more people with a lot better technology. And they began to sing as they marched. And you could see tears in the eyes of the soldiers. And, and they were not tears of joy. They were tears of fear of death. But behind the tears, there was a courage that they were being filled with as a result of singing this song together. And if that's true in war with a song that has no necessary spiritual content, imagine how much more it's true in the church. There's supernatural power and things of supernatural power that happen as we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But there's one more aspect. If there's really one thing I want you to learn today is that worshiping together from the heart enriches Christ's word in you. Worshiping together, and we're, in this case we're literally talking about song and praise worship, musical worship, instrumental worship. Worshiping together from the heart is part of that enrichment process of God's word in you.
but it has to be from the heart. Listen to the last part of this verse in Colossians 16. With thankfulness in your hearts to God. Going back to Ephesians here. Ephesians says the very same thing <clears throat> in, uh, at the very end of 19. Making melody to the Lord with your heart. Now in this case, when it talks about the heart, it's not talking about the emotions versus the mind and the, and the, and the area of reason. It's talking about that innermost place in your life. The deepest place of your being, which includes your mind, it includes your emotions, it includes your soul and your spirit and everything you are, even in a sense your body. The very most inner place uh, that you have within yourself is your, is your heart. And we're not talking about that beating muscle either. We're talking about something spiritual. And God sees it. It's that place where your desires and your mind and your willpower and your decision uh, uh, the, the place where you make decisions from, it's all, it's all there and God sees it. And, and that's from the place from which we worship. It's a very shallow worship when it doesn't come from the heart. And so you, in your heart, are oftentimes those things that God wants to refine by fire. Things that resist worshiping him in some way. Things that want to go through the motions rather than really truly worship him. Think, think of yourself right now. Think of anything you're holding back. But you're holding it back at a heart level. And so your worship is not as full as it might be. And so when we sing these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, even if in your mind you're thinking, yeah, I agree with this. And even if your heart, you're sort of going along with it emotionally. Even if you're emotionally moved, it's not necessarily the same thing as your whole being being with and for this worship. When that happens, that's the only time that the enrichment process actually takes place. You hold anything back. You leave anything out. You see some dross rising to the surface and you're like, nope, I want to keep that part as part of my, my person and my life. And no, no, that action over here that you're highlighting, I'm not giving that up. I need that it's something I use to make myself feel better. Whatever it is, you'll shortcut the enrichment process. And so it's, it wouldn't be true that every time that we get together and worship that every person is being enriched. You are being enriched together as we sing psalms and spiritual songs. You're having God's word dwell in you richly, but only if your heart's in the right place. So yes, worshiping together from the heart will enrich Christ's word in you. It will concentrate your relationship to the Lord. It will reconcile you to him in a in deep way. I don't mean in terms of for the first time, but I mean in areas that you've been going astray, but it'll also reconcile you with other people, with one another. So I want you to consider, especially as uh, it ends in here in verse 20, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Why do we have reverence for Christ so much that we might actually be willing to say, okay, you have your way, I won't have mine. It's a liberty issue, you have your way. Because Christ died for us to be able to be unified together. If Christ hadn't died, you wouldn't even know me. Be off living my own life. Sooner or later trying to take over the world, probably. <laughs> Megalomaniacal sociopath, right? But through Christ's death on the cross, he puts to death those things in me that want to use my own power for my own glory. And then he brings me to a place where I don't have to serve him, but I want to serve him because he died for me. And now I'd rather spend my whole life together being unified with the church and helping to unify a church with preaching in any other ways that I can than doing anything that makes me look good. I really would. That's what I want. I'd rather be here than in the NFL. <laughs> They're not even getting to play <laughs> and we're getting to meet. So consider that. Consider what is it in your life that you might not be willing to submit to one another in a way that would unify you together. You may just be a guest of Boone's Ferry and this is not the primary place that God is unifying you together in a local church. But there still may be ways that you're resisting to be unified. Things that you can give up, things that you can let go. And they may not be in relationship to somebody else. They may be in relationship directly to God. And they may be a subjective thing where you know you can't keep getting away with this thing over here because you know you're not doing it from faith. God is leading you to do something else. But you can hide it because nobody can objectively say that's universally wrong. And those are the places that only the Holy Spirit can come down and reach in. Or maybe there is something in your life that everybody knows is wrong and maybe you're not even hiding it but it's something you have to give up and you have to give it up now or you won't restart that enrichment process. If you want God's word, Christ's word to dwell in you richly, you have to come with your whole heart. Worshiping together, 
from the heart will concentrate God's word's power in your life. I think about a vision of this church where everyone was having God's, Christ's word concentrated in them. Think of the gift you have if you know your spiritual gift. Think of it being fanned into flame in such a way that you build other people up in love and glorify God with whatever actions and words that come out of that kind of gift. Think of that being fanned into flame just in one small church. You know how much power there is in that? More than in nuclear fission. Much more. Because it's actually taught to us in the Bible that through the Holy Spirit, and through this enrichment process, the very fullness of God can come and dwell in us. All of God in us by the Spirit. You know, I used, to, uh, I used to view art more than I did now. In Germany, that's a thing. You go to museums and view art, and everybody does it. And France is right there. There's all kinds of museums. And there's this one where there's this Native American guy and he's got a giant longbow and he's shooting an arrow up and you see him grimacing and all his muscles taut. It's like he's shooting it at God. There's no bird up above, you know? And it's kind of like man or human beings anger towards God and shooting towards him. Uh, but a bow and arrow is not very powerful. But this Indian, this Native American guy, he looks so powerful. Well, what if we shot all of our nuclear weapons at God right now? It would be just as weak as shooting an arrow at him but the desire would be the very same thing. The fullness of God living in us is more powerful than, than any power that exists on earth, even multiplied by infinity. God is so powerful. And this is, this is a call to us as a church to have the very fullness of God indwell us individually and also as a spiritual house of relationships to one another and to him.